Today, we are continuing in our study in the book of Acts. If you are new with us, okay, uh, we are studying the book of Acts, okay, this year, all right? And we are on Acts uh, um, chapter 5, but it is the 8th sermon in this series already. And I've entitled today's sermon, Why Has God Freed Us? Okay, why has God freed us? Or I really could have also entitled it, Your Second Life. Right, um, But first, I just want to get into the Word. Let us read the text. You can read it and follow it along, but I'm just going to read it out loud here. All right, Acts 5 verse 17. It's quite a lot, yeah? So I just want you to be able to follow. Okay, to be f- By the way, context. Ananias and Sapphira have just fallen dead at the apostles' feet um, for for misrepresenting how holy they are. Okay, I think that's a better way to put it, right? They've been buried and then miracles, signs, wonders continue to take place in the midst of this new uh, uh, family. And verse 17 says, Then the high priests and all his associates, there are a lot of them, okay, um, who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. Remember? Signs, wonders, everything happening, they were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts as they had been told, and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel. This must have been quite a big gathering. The whole Sanhedrin has shown up, okay, to judge or to, to put to trial this small handful of uneducated believers of Jesus, right? The full assembly of the elders of Israel and sent to the jail for the apostles. And so they wait for the apostles to come back from the jail. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, We found the jail securely locked, with the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priest were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Okay, And I just want to point out, if you are the chief priest, you are angry. If you are the captain of the prison, you're probably really frightened, okay? Because because this this they, they got lost on your watch, okay? So so this is not cool if you're the captain of the temple guard, right? Then someone came and said, Look, the man you put in jail are standing in the temple courts, teaching the people. At that the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. But they did not use force because they feared the people would stone them. So there is already a shift in the, if you can say, acceptance, or if you may even say popularity, right? They had gained favour with the crowds. And now because they gained favour with the crowds, even the temple guards don't dare to manhandle them, okay? They bring them back respectfully. Not because they wanted to bring them back respectfully, out of fear of the crowds. Now, the apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in His name, He said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and saviour that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Now when they heard this, They were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee, you notice earlier was Sadducees, 
the whole Sanhedrin was made out of Sadducees. And internally, they have their own little political kind of like rivalry, you know. The Sadducees were in official public office, okay. They were in official positions. The Pharisees were a bit like a group, a, a bit like a pressure group, right, who considered themselves uh, uh, bringing back the true the, 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 the true practices of, of the Jews, right? So now a Pharisee, okay, speaks up. His name is Gamaliel, okay? Gamaliel, we will discover later to have been the rabbi who taught Paul the apostle. Paul has not shown up yet. We're only in chapter 5, right? Paul will show up in chapter 9, okay? But this is Gamaliel. He's a well-respected teacher of the law. A Pharisee named Gamaliel, teacher of the law, Honored by all the people, so he cuts a, his credibility cuts across political lines. So the Sadducees also respect him, right? Stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin, men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Theudas appeared, claiming to be somebody. And about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed and his followers were dispersed and it all came to nothing. And after him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in this present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, then you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourself fighting against God. Now his speech persuaded them. Did it persuade you? <laughs> his speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in <laughs> and flogged them. <laughs> Leave this man alone, I advise you. But they still flogged him. Okay, la. I think must restore some pride. Cannot, cannot let them go too easily. Kena sepak sikit. And then, okay, la, claw, claw, boom, right? Okay. He, well, okay, moving on. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, but they've already done that. So it's quite hollow. It's quite pathetic, in fact, right? Um, they're still like, oh, don't remember, don't speak in Jesus' name, you know, and get out, right? Um, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing. Now, how many of you think that's a strange response? Right? You have been, you have been flogged, right? Flogged, whipped, huh? okay? You have been manhandled, at least inside the Sanhedrin, not before that, right? You've been threatened. And they left rejoicing. They really are a different sort of people. And, I, and my prayer is that we, as Christians in the 21st century, really will recover what it means to be this kind of believers, right? They left rejoicing. Because why? Because they counted, they, they, they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Wow! Worthy? Of what? Honour? Yeah, some kind of honour. Worthy of praise? Not really. Worthy of, of good treatment? Certainly not. Worthy of suffering disgrace. How many of you think suffering disgrace is a worthy thing? Now, suffering disgrace for any old no good reason is not a worthy thing. And it should not be praiseworthy. And it should not be something you go around seeking. Not that you would anyway. But suffering disgrace for the name of Jesus, that's a different story altogether. And they considered it a rejoicing. Now, day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, now you see now here Gamaliel's uh, 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 advice really coming together, right? Because after this, day by day, house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus was the Messiah. There was a short period of relative peace. But if you turn your Bible to the next page, you will see immediately that peace is very short-lived, okay? And, and those guys in the Sanhedrin quite quickly um, get roused again, okay, to, to, to whack, okay? But really, I want to bring our thoughts back to the prison break moment. How many of you know that there are prison breaks in the book of Acts? 
right? How many of you watch the the TV series Prison Break, which has nothing to do with this? But 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 yeah, okay. If you've watched, if you if you're older and you watch Escape from Alcatraz, can you raise your hands, right? Yeah yeah yeah. No, my my people are here in the house, right? I watched Escape from Alcatraz as a kid. How many of you know? Okay, how many Prison Breaks there are in the Book of Acts? Huh? Pop quiz now. Three. Bill says three. If Bill says three, it must be three, right? Right? On or not, or not. How many prison breaks are there in the book of Acts? Come on, come on. A, one. B, two. C, three. D, four. Come on, let's go. C, three. 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 Any takers for two? No. No. There are three prison breaks. So you're good, huh? You're good. You're uh, you are uh, getting really proficient with your Bible, right? There are three prison breaks in Acts. We are here in the first one, okay? Now, do you notice how, almost how easy it was for this prison break to happen? Almost, it, it, it was resolved in one sentence. Angel came and opened the doors and said, go stand in the temple, right? It's like, whoa, whoa. Like, so actually, strictly speaking, the first one is the least storied one. Okay? And you will hear many people preach on the second one where the angel shows up and says, put on your cloak, get up, start walking. He walks through one gate, he walks through another gate. You know, suddenly the angels are gone. He still thinks he's dreaming, you know. You all know that one? That's Peter's second prison break, right? Um, the third one is the one that uh, is my personal favourite because we have a kid's Bible, uh, um, the BM Bible, and there's a picture of Paul and Silas singing in prison, you know. Um, that's one, they're singing and worshipping and then there's an earthquake and the Philippian jailer is like, he's freaked out because he's good, uh, the, all the prisoners are going to leave and then the whole family ends up getting baptised. All this later in this year, okay? Later in this year. For now, we are in the first of the three prison breaks. Now, my question for you is, why did God set the apostles free? Why did God set the apostles free? I'm just going to ask Athalia to pass me uh, my journal. Yeah, because I've got some notes written in it. Yeah. Why? Look into your Bibles, okay? I'm sure, okay, if you, if you have your Bibles, you can look into it. Why? What were the immediate instructions of the angel when, when the angel told them to be, set them free pretty much, right? And that's really important. You want to know why? Because to be set free from prison, it's a bit like having your life given back to you. Now, I'm going to turn the question back to you. Why has God not just set the apostles free? Why has God set you free? You don't have to answer this question now. I'll be revisiting this question later today. But why has God set you free? You know, there's a myth. Of course, we know it's a myth, right? That the people say that cats have nine lives. Don't you all know that? The cats have nine lives. Well, they don't, okay? Um, but they say cats have nine lives because um, <laughs> they seem to be able to fall from great heights and, and cheat death uh, uh, over and over again. I, uh, apparently, um, there was a cat that fell from 20, 32 stories. I, 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 I was just googling about cats with nine lives. A cat fell from 32 stories and scarcely broke a bone. Not, like, like, it it kind of like landed soft. Um, um, and, and, and cats' anatomy is just that way, right? They can kind of like um, turn correctly and their, their, bones are just, their joints are just built in such a way um, uh, that, that they absorb the, the weight and everything. The whole, the whole weight distribution of a cat right, is just perfectly calibrated to fall from ridiculous heights and not die. Now, they say cats have nine lives, right? Um, how many lives do we have? Right? One. We have got one life. And we often hear people say, you've got one life, you know, live it to your best, right? Uh, you've got one life. Do, uh, uh, um, uh, make it meaningful. Um, but I, I want to challenge you to think of it differently. It's still the same. The, the truth is still the same, okay? But I want to challenge you to think of it differently. As Christians, there is another way to think of this, and it's that you have two lives. Good news, you have two lives. Yay! The bad news is, you have used up your first one. <laughs> you have used up your first life, right? Um, and, and so what, what, what happened to your first life? Your first life was left in prison, in chains, 
Because as Christians, we all know that we have been set free. We all know that the old has gone, the new has come. We all know that once upon a time, we were all enslaved, enslaved and imprisoned in some way or other to sin, to wrongdoing. And we owed a debt of righteous living that just could not ever be paid off. And we were shackled to our addictions. We were shackled to our, 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 our wrongdoing, to our filthiness and filthy living, whether it was in our hands or in our thoughts or in our mouth or in our eyes or maybe just in our hearts. Maybe we could curate our external behaviours quite well, but in our hearts, it was, still, it was still not right. And at one point, we were all, if I may say, filthy rags, as the Bible says. But the Lord has set us free. If you are a Christian, you believe that the Lord has broken those chains and He has set you free. And even if you grew up in a Christian home and you never had your, your went off and enjoyed life years, you know, um, enjoyed life years, right? You still have been set free. You still have been set free from the burden and the expectation of having to save yourself, of having to, to, to live a, a, um, a life that that is right so that you can earn your own salvation. You've been set free from guilt. You've been set free from shame. You've been set free uh, from, from pain and wounds and hurts. And in many ways, the Lord is still doing that work in you. For all of us, we have been set free like prisoners. Having had our chains broken, having had the doors flung open, and now we can walk out. And the Lord really has let us out of slavery like he led Egypt, right? Like, like he led Israel out of Egypt. He's walked us out of one place of darkness after another. In many ways, we are living our second life and our first life is behind us. Why has God set you free? You know, if you, if you talk to people who have either been in prison um, or or people who have, been, who have been rescued from being caught and being almost certainly uh, in prison, you will hear them say and speak um, about that experience almost akin to having been born again, like they have a totally new life. I, I met a man who was formerly on death row, right? Um, or he was in prison, okay? And he was in, with inmates who were on death row and he saw them one by one uh, um, uh, have to go, right? And he was, he was saved in prison. And today, by some chance, he has been released, okay? And today, he is evangelizing. He is sharing the Word of God in places where no one would go to share the Word of God. He is going, okay? In some ways, he's living a life that's very much like the early disciples were, right? Right on the edge between God and no God, right? It's just the, carrying the, the mission field, right? Between with God and a world that has no God. At the edge of the light where it meets darkness. And he's living his life all out now, all out for the, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, I knew a guy, I won't call him a friend these days because I just lost touch with him over the last 10 years or so, but I know a guy um, who was once almost caught carrying drugs uh, um, and going into an airport trying to fly it from Semenanjung to Sabah. And uh, he, had, he had the contraband stuffed uh, uh, all around his body, right? He had it stuff. Uh, um, <laughs> when I say all around the body, I really mean all around the body, okay? Um, and it wasn't comfortable, as you can imagine. Um, and if the back breaks, he's in a lot of trouble, okay? Uh, more, more kinds of trouble than you can think of, right? And he thought and he had been told, um, uh, he's a drug mule, la, okay? Gotta earn money, la, okay? Um, and so he... He was queuing up to go through immigration um, and he thought it was going to be a straightforward one because it's, it's straightforward for most people, right? But so happens on that day while he was queuing up, um, some officers came and started to ask questions. 
and to I think there may have been a tip off, right? And so they were asking questions. They started to check some of the people who were in front of him in the queue. So this friend, this guy I know, he started panicking, right? And he knows that if he tries to see this job all the way through, he's likely to get caught, like right there in a few steps in front of him. He turns around and heads for the men's bathroom. He empties everything out. He tears open all the bags, flushes everything down the toilet. Anything that was stuffed inside him, he pulled it out and he flushed it all down the toilet, you know. Um, went back and rejoined that queue, shaking and afraid because he knew he came so close. Gantong, ah. They one caught 100% gantong, ah. Yeah. And he's been given a second lease of life, really. And when, when I met him, we were at a men's breakthrough weekend and we were in a small group together. So he shared quite intimately about his experience. When he, when he talked to me, he had the, he had the tone and the, and, and, the, and the atmosphere of a guy who's really been given a new lease of life. And for him, he really has. He was looking at certain death. He's left that lifestyle. He spent years by God's grace with his family, trying to hold him right again, you know. And, and last I checked, you know, um, uh, his, his sister was in KL, caught up with her sister as well. And I know that, uh, that he's got married, he's got a kid, he's being a responsible father. And, and God has turned his life around. And he's living his life for the Lord. I'm so thankful for that. But my friends, stories like this are the extraordinary ones. Stories like this is he had his form of prison break, right? They all have their form of prison breaks, but you have your own prison break story too because God has led you out of darkness as well. He has led you out of certain death as well. He has led you out of your own version of being on death row. He has, right? It's just that it, it's a bit more prolonged so we don't feel it quite the same way. But let's answer this question. Why did God set the apostles free? He says, go, stand in the temple courts. Tell the people about this new life. And so even here you can see three things, right? Go, stand, tell. Go, go where? Go somewhere. For you, in, in, in the case of these disciples, go to the temple court. Stand there. Stand where? Stand for what? Stand for Jesus. And do what? Tell. Tell them about this new life that you have. Tell them about the new life. Don't force it down their throats. Just tell them, right? Don't beat them to death with it, but tell them. Don't not tell them. Tell them, right? And so it's, it's, in, it's interesting because this happens in the middle of the night. And guess what? If you read your Bible very quickly, you might miss this little detail. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts. They were set free in the middle of the night. They have no homes. They have nowhere to go. And let's just say it happens at 12. They have to hang around for six hours. Huh? They have to hang around for six hours before they can go. They can go to the temple courts, lah, you know, in the middle of the night, but no one's there, right? So they can, they can ikot bulat bulat and like, oh, and just says, go, go, lor. and he's standing, bolang, uh, still go, say, lor, right, followed by road. But no, God has, God, God has given us, uh, um, I think when God calls us, sometimes we, we are called to go immediately. And I believe, and I'm a strong believer that obedience is immediate, yeah, okay, um, and delayed obedience is not obedience. But when they say, go, stand, tell, they still had to wait for daybreak. And so, my friends, even in our own prison breaks, every time God sets us free, God tells us to do something, occasionally, there will be circumstances when He does, the situation demands that we put pause. We wait. We, we wait for the opportunity to become correct. We wait for people to show up. We wait for people to be receptive. We wait for and along the way, you do the things necessary in order to wait well. So my friends, I know that Easter is coming up and it's normal for you to hear us say from the stage, okay, invite a friend, invite a friend, invite a friend, okay. 
and it's true, you should invite a friend, okay? Um, but I want to add some new ones to this, okay? When we ask you to invite a friend, I know because I've got friends and they're not all at the same place of preparedness to come to church, okay? Not every friend is at the same place of preparedness to come to church. For that matter, not every friend who comes to church is at the same place of preparedness to say yes and make a decision for the gospel. I understand that, okay? I want you to know this. If they are not prepared to come to church, the church should be prepared to go to them. But the gospel should not not get to them. It should still get to them. Does that make sense? And part of the waiting that I want to share with you is that if your friend is not prepared to come to church and hear the gospel as articulated here by someone like me, then guess what? Your waiting period, your waiting for daybreak, and your preparation for that daybreak means that your season now is to prepare yourself to be the church that goes to them. Does that make sense, my, my friends? Okay, so we are going to be a church that is, sometimes we call it centrifugal, right? Centripedal. Centripedal is where, where, where there's substance here and all the heat goes to it, okay? A centripedal church is when we are the church and we expect everybody to come to us. Come to us because we have events. Come to us because we have King Stable. Come to us because we've got Good Friday, you know. And we ask people to come here, hoping that whatever happens here is going to impact and shape them. And that is a valid way to think about church because the church is a place of gathering, okay. And so please, if you have friends who are ready to come to church, please bring them to church, okay, and go the extra mile. Drive them, you know, like meet up, you know, plan lunch with them, whatever it is. Go the extra mile. But there will be many, many times where the church does not behave centripidly, the church behaves centrifugally, meaning that it doesn't outside come in, it is inside go out. Inside go out kind of church. And the whole book of Acts is a journey of about eight chapters of all the substance just boiling in Jerusalem and then in 8 verse 1, bang! They all go out. And persecution pushes them out, by the way. Yeah? Okay, if not, they may have stayed for another few chapters until new, more persecution comes. They go out and it becomes a centrifugal kind of church. They go out and they, they, they look for friends, they, they look for new cities, they start breaking new ground, they go into dangerous places and it goes out and out and out and if I'm just going to underline this and move on if this Easter season your friend is not yet ready if you invite them and they say no no thank you you know um, you can just say that's great that's fine you know um, but I'll get coffee with you right and then you can be the church that goes to them now it takes it, it takes experience don't be freaked out by it you know but just tell them remember go stand tell okay are we good? Are we good? Do you have a friend in your mind? Someone, you have a friend in your mind? I see some of you nodding, okay? Do you have a friend in your mind? I have some friends. I have quite a few friends uh, uh, in my mind and I can immediately kind of like tear them on like preparedness and, uh, and some are more ready, you know, to come here. Some of them know I'm a pastor so the moment I open my mouth, they're like, whoa, right? Uh, and then some of them, um, uh, I suppose they might be they might be a bit more open to me going to them to share, to, 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 to speak to them about life and be their friend and then to, if the opportunity is right, if daybreak shows up, to share with them the hope that I have. And I want to encourage every single one of you to be sensitive, to be attentive to your friends, to be prayerful over them and to look for the daybreak where you can go or when they can come. Amen? Amen? Now, now the story moves on. The story moves on. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. Okay? Then they said, We gave you strict orders not to teach in His name, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, blah, blah. And then they say this. Now, this is a side point. I want to show you because it's super important as we're coming uh, uh, to Good Friday. They said, Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Now this line here, you are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood, it's, it's, it's not coming from nowhere. Every time Peter and the apostles preach, remember I've been sharing with for those of you who have been hanging around here for the last few weeks, you will know, every time they preach the gospel, by the way, their gospel is not John 3.16. At that time, John had not written his John 3.16 yet. Okay, okay? Their gospel is, 
Jesus, this Jesus died in the hands of wicked men. And they called them out for being the people, the wicked men who killed this Jesus. But then he was raised to life and now he has all authority under his feet, right? That is always the gospel as shared by the apostles in the book of Acts. And now, because every time they're talking about Jesus' death, they make it a point to remind them, whom you killed! Whom you killed! Right? And so they're getting they're terasa already and they said that and now you're determined to make us guilty of this man. Were they guilty of this man's blood? Were they really guilty of Jesus' blood? Yes. Most of us will instinctively say yes. I'm going to show you in the Bible where it is a yes, right? Acts 5 is on your left side of your screen. Determined in blue to make us guilty of this man's blood. But I want to show you Matthew 24. It's chilling, but I want to show you. Because at the height of Jesus' trial, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, has been trying, though not very hard, but trying politically, trying to work a way around setting Jesus free. And the crowds are just not having it. And they are crying out, crucify him, crucify him. And this was taking place on Friday morning. Crucify him. And when it reached a boiling point, the crowds and the people said, well, Pilate said, he washes his hands symbolically, right? He has a, he has a bowl of water brought out. He washes his hands symbolically. He tells them, I'm not guilty of this man's death anymore. I've washed my hands of this case. And then the crowd says, it's, the crowd says, his blood on us and on our children. Now, that's not funny. That's very, very crazy thing. It's pronouncing a curse on yourself. And it's pronouncing a curse on their generations to come. And they, at this moment, were so enraged, so, en so drunk with rage, that they heaped the guilt of Jesus on themselves. Now, I just want to say this. Over the years, this has been used to justify anti-Semitism all around the world. This has been used by people who are anti-Jews, anti okay, to, to, to explain away the Holocaust, where four million Jews were gassed and killed, right? This has been used to say, well, yeah, but they heaped it on themselves. See this verse? And that's not the posture of this church, yeah? Yeah, just so you know, that's not our posture, yeah? Yeah, okay. In fact, I tell you what's our posture. Our posture is that they were given opportunity to repent. They were given opportunity to repent and to be, receive the forgiveness of sins. I'll show you that in a moment. And that this could have been wiped out. You think this is unforgivable? This is not unforgivable. You think your own sins are unforgivable? They are not too far too bad, too horrendous for God to forgive. On the cross, Jesus died to pay the penalty for all sins and all kinds of sins, no matter how gross you think your sins have been. He paid the price for it all. And I want you to know this, that though we have been guilty, and in a way, you've heard the expression that it was our sins that nailed the cross that nailed him to the cross, right? Now, in many ways, we were responsible for his death, but he forgives us. And if there's someone in this room, now there are many new faces, I don't know all your stories anymore. If there's someone in this room and you are carrying guilt because you have failed people in the past, you're carrying guilt and shame because you have left behind brokenness, you have failed in projects, you have lost money before, maybe not your own money even, it's worse, maybe sometimes you've lost people's money, you've lost people's trust, you've failed others, you've mishandled relationships, 
Maybe you have raised your children in a way that makes you feel regretful or maybe you have not been so kind to your parents and maybe now they've passed on. You carry guilt, you carry pain in you and you carry it every day and things will just trigger you. I want you to know that the, our Lord Jesus Christ forgives you of that sin. He doesn't start step and say, no lah, not so bad lah, because He knows and you know, you both know it was that bad. And He does not soften it. He forgives you for it. He calls it out for what it is and He says, I forgive you. Don't carry that sin on you. Don't carry that shame on you. Don't carry that weight of guilt on you anymore. You have been forgiven. The God of the heavens and the earth forgives you. Even if your father never forgives you, even if your former business partner never forgives you, I forgive you. And their unforgiveness over you is their problem now. But I forgive you. I've given you new chance. Now, go and sin no more. Amen? Let's pray for a moment. Let's pray for a moment. We're not done. We're just going to pray for a moment. Heavenly Father, God of all salvation, God, your love knows no measure. You love us, if I may say, at the expense of your own self. You love us and you've forgiven us. Father, if there are friends among us on this day who have been carrying guilt and shame and pain and wounds, and maybe your issue, church, is not that you need to be forgiven. Maybe you need to forgive. You need to release forgiveness to someone. Father, we turn to you and we ask, Lord God, for ability, for strength to forgive and to be forgiven. Father, let us not be so proud that we cannot forgive another person. But you forgave us. Therefore, surely we can forgive others. Or even if we can't, you can give us the ability to forgive others. Lord Jesus, let us not be so proud that we, that we can't receive forgiveness. Cannot. Nge -nge must hold on to the, to, 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 the, to the punishment until we die. No, Lord Jesus, no. Father, forgive us and help, help give us a soft heart to receive forgiveness. Father, I just pray, Lord, Holy Spirit, you minister to hearts right now and work deep inside us, Lord God, to bring us to be able to wipe away years of offence, years of pain and years of hurt to come before your throne and clean the slate completely so that before you later, we can gather and take communion and be one with the, our Lord Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, thank you. I can be communed with you because you have wiped my slate perfectly clean. And now I can even commune with my brothers. I can symbolically commune with my friends who are in another church right now and I forgive them. And on this Sunday, they are all partaking communion too. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will knit our hearts together. And even if we never become great friends again, business partners again, or a family like we were again, Lord, clean the slate with forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Sorry, it's Matthew 27 just now. Yeah, this was 27, not 24. Okay. Um, they are not near each other at all on the keyboard. I don't know how I made that mistake. <laughs> Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God. When they were threatened and told, don't preach in His name anymore, they said, no, we must obey God rather than men. And you will see this pattern showing up again and again and again throughout the book of Acts. Every time they are threatened, every time people come and intimidate them and tell them, no, you shouldn't do this thing. Don't talk in His name anymore. Don't pray in public anymore. Don't do this anymore. Don't use His name anymore. Don't read this book anymore. They say, no. Well, 
in earlier in an earlier version of this same of this same rebuttal he says if it seems right to you to follow man you go ahead but for me i'm going to obey god rather than man right and i love that i love it that peter sometimes when he replies he has a, a bit of sass right obey god over people and that's going to be a hallmark of a courageous church because there will be many people who don't want the church to be courageous, who don't want the church to be dangerous. And two weeks ago, I shared about what it means for us as a church to be dangerous, to be on the edge between life and death, between righteousness and wickedness, right? For us to not be safe in our little holy huddles, but to be right on the brink of people who love God and people who have not yet come to love God. And right somewhere on that same edge are people who absolutely uh, hate God and would seek to destroy everything we are doing. And sometimes it still nags me that if we are not facing any kind of trouble, any kind of oppression, any kind of persecution, any kind of challenge or headwinds, I really sometimes wonder if we are doing things right. And I'm not going to turn that into a statement. I think it's a bit too far for me to turn it into a statement. But I ask myself that all the time. And when I say that, I don't say it to mean that we go out there and try to cherry gado with people, right? We are not cherry gadoing with anybody. But when you live right on the edge of light and darkness, darkness will push back. It will push back. And I ask even myself, am I pastoring this church dangerously enough such that that we can feel the headwinds that darkness is pushing back because that's when you know you're right on the brink you're right on the edge. And if you never feel headwinds, it's always cool and easy. We never have to say, I'm going to obey God over people. Obey God and obey people is the same thing because we are in our little kind of like safe space. But when people start to push back, then you have to obey God over people. Now, there will be many people who will say the same things as God. Then you can obey God and obey people the same. It's easy. But there will be people who tell you things contrary to God. And there'll be days where we have to get to a place where we are ministering in those headwinds. When we get there, obey God over people. How do you train for a day like that? A centrifugal church will treat church as training ground. So that this is training and outside is match day, right? I don't want to think about football because last night was a terrible night uh, for a few of us, okay? But... Church should be like training ground and the world outside should be like match day so that we come in on a Sunday and we are, we are strengthened, we, are, we have our value systems reshaped, we have our brokenness uh, mended, we have our past wounds healed, we have our limbs you know, uh, uh, worked through and we are stronger when we walk out, we are encountered Jesus, we remember our Bibles, we go out into this world, into the real thing. Not that there's anything unreal here, but you're not saved for church. You are not saved for church to keep perpetuating programs in church. You are not saved to perpetuate church, you know. You are saved to bring Jesus out there, out there and there into this world. That's what we are saved for. And when you go out there, there will be days when, how do you train yourself to obey God over people in the small things? Already start obeying God over the small light pressures that Malaysian urban KL society will put on you. Already start to obey God. And I can't tell you what those are for you. You have to figure it out yourself. And so a pastor can only say so much and you have to do the rest of the work there because you know what pressures are there in your workplace or in your homes or in your neighbourhoods. You know the pressures. I can only guess. Obey God over people. And the story goes on, Right? The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, <laughs> whom you killed, right? By hanging him on a cross, right? God exalted him to his own right hand as prince, as saviour, that he might bring Israel to what? Repentance and forgive their sins. And that's why today we sang, wave upon wave of grace upon grace, right? washing our sins away 
What can wash away our sins and make me new again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me white as snow? No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. My friends, Good Friday is when Jesus forgave us of our sins and forgiveness was open even to the Sanhedrin, even to the Jewish crowds, even to the Pharisees. And I think Gamaliel saw something and he backed off. Godly enough to back off. Forgiveness was available to them. My friends, forgiveness is available to you, to you as well. Amen? Go, stand and tell, wait for daybreak, obey God over people, and share. Share what? Share Jesus crucified. Share Jesus resurrected. Share Jesus crucified and resurrected to bring people to repentance. Why did God set you free? You know, my friends, this week I was, I've been mulling on the purpose of our lives. It's kind of a big statement. Uh, Thalia and I were invited by a friend from another church to drop by their cell and share with them something. And it was many year, months ago and we said, yes, we would. And, and, and the occasion was just two nights ago on Friday night. And they gave us a topic. The topic was, what on earth are we here for? It's like, wow, so big, so big, right? How do you start? Where do you go? Right? Um, and we found, our, we found a way somehow to share with them about the purpose. The chief end of men and women is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. We started with that. Share with them, what does it mean to, glor to glorify God that there is weight to our lives? Our lives are not empty you know, or light. You know, when, you know when you pick up something that is cheap, or counterfeit is just lighter it's just, it just doesn't have that weight and God wants your life to be full of weight full of weight weight of glory weight of glory you know the verse in Habakkuk 2.14 it says that the glory the knowledge of God and the glory of God will cover the earth as the waters clothe the sea team you don't have to go find it it's okay right okay I know the team is like let's go find the Bible verse okay it's okay the knowledge and the glory of God will cover the earth as the waters clothe the sea. How is that going to be fulfilled? Now, in the past, I used to imagine, and if you're in Sungai Buloh Church, you may have heard me say this before. In the past, I used to imagine that it would cover like a, like, let's say like a cloud, right? The glory would cover the earth like a cloud, like some mystical, strange substance covering, hovering over the earth as the waters close the sea. Or, maybe even more literal, you think of it like a literal flood, right? Like, the waters just cover land, right? So, okay, God's glory is going to cover the land. But that's not how it works because that thing does not contain... It's a bit far-fetched to say that God's knowledge of God is going to cover the earth that way. But I tell you how the knowledge of God and the glory of God is going to cover the earth as the waters close the sea. Like this, when the knowledge of God resides in His Christians. And when their lives are heavy, there is weight, there is glory, they have experienced the glory and every day when you and I go out, our lives are not meaningless, our lives carry God's glory, God's goodness, God's mercy. And when they see us, they see godly living and they see the living God. Amen? Friends, when people see you, does your life make their life better or did their life become worse because you showed up? Have you ever worked with people like that? You have, right? That's why you're laughing, right? You work with someone and when they cross path with you or they deliver you a piece of work, your life literally became worse off. You made my life worse. Do you want to be like that to people out there? Of course not. Quite the opposite. You want to be the fellow who literally when you interact with people, their life becomes better. Their lives becomes more beautiful. It thinks work. Like, wow, your work is good. 
The way you formatted this is fantastic. The way you solved this problem works. You are competent. You are clever. You are hardworking. You are conscientious. You are thoughtful. You are attentive to people's needs. Whatever it may be, when you go out and you bring good and godly living into the world out there, they don't just see your godly living, they see the living God. And it must be our aspiration to go out into this world and make people's lives and the world out there better because it's a decaying world, my friends. It's a decay desperately in need of us going out there to cover this earth. The way waters will clothe the sea, we should clothe this place. And when we all carry the knowledge of God and the glory of God and we're going out there and making the world a better place, then God's glory is being seen by people out there in this world. That's a heavy life. That's glorious life. That's a worthwhile life. That's why God has set you free. And so I want to end on this note. Gamaliel says, if it is not from God, it's going to fail. Don't worry. No need to ganchiong. If this whole thing is not of God, in one year, two years, and if you, if you know all if you know intertestamental history, right, between Old and New Testament, there were a lot of would-be messiahs rose up like Theudas and Judas of, of, of the Galilean. You know, these guys will rise up and uh, r- gather a, a rebellion, you know, try to take down, uh, um, take down the, the Greek rulers, take down the Roman rulers, and it will keep failing and it will keep failing. And, and that's why Gamaliel, who knows his history, says that, guys, guys, no need kanchiong. If this is not of God, sure fail. Anyway, you don't have to do anything, it will fail by itself. And how many times we have seen, right, things not of God that rise to prominence and then pop. But if it's from God, no one's going to be able to stop them. And I pray, so I below church, we will always be doing things of God. Not building man's empire because those will pop just like that. Okay, Not building human glory or a brand. Gosh, church and brand you know what, let's not put those two words together and you know, let's try our best not to put those two words together, church and brand, okay? Um, um, if it's of man, it will not last. But if it is of God, if it is of God, no man can stop it. In Matthew 16, Jesus said this to Peter, Peter, the same Peter who just got prison broken. Jesus said, I tell you, you are Peter, Cephas, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. No man can stop. And Peter would go on all the way to Rome as well. We we know about Paul going to Rome. Peter himself would go all the way to Rome and be known as the first bishop of Rome. And after him, Clement I. And after him, the many other bishops of of Rome. And then Christianity kept spreading. And in many other places, it kept going. And if you gave me another one and a half hours, or if you gave me another five weeks, I will start teaching you church history. And I'll bring Rodney up here and we'll do, we'll do a five-week church history. Five, not four, right? We'll do a five-week church history session with all of you, right? To show you that indeed the gates of hell has never been able to prevail against God's work when it is acting in righteousness, in truth, with Jesus at the center, not man, with His fame, you know, going out, not ours. Amen? And that's my call. That's my hope. That's my hope. So church, I'm going to close. I'm going to pray. I just want to invite the worship team to come up. And then we will partake of communion. For our friends who are back home and watching this online right now, we will be partaking of communion so you can prepare your emblems in your own homes as well. We'll be signing in from a, from a laptop later. We're bringing it over to the other side. Um, so, so you guys hang in there if you're online. For all of us who are here physically, I want to pray together with you as we close. But in a moment... Let's just all take a moment. All quieten down our hearts. All eyes closed, all heads bowed. If you've never made a decision for Jesus Christ to be your Lord, to be your Saviour, to bend your knee before Him and say, Jesus, I give you my loyalty. Jesus, I give you my whole heart. Thank you for saving me. 
today I give my life to you for the first time first time if you want to make that decision I just want you to stretch your hand out and put it down so I can see it I won't assume that every single one of you is Christian if you want to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Saviour first time stretch your hand all the way up and put it down and help me see it Amen Father I thank you Lord God Thank you for all of us here Friend if you're not yet a Christian and you have not raised your hand I want to tell you it's okay and I want to invite you to keep coming back to find out more about this Jesus and we are always here ready and eager to share with you about the hope that we have and I just hope that as you come back and come back again that you'll find in this place something different that will draw you towards this Jesus for now it's okay I want to pray for the rest of us for all of us right now that our lives will be meaningful Father I just pray that you'll teach us to live meaningful lives Lives that are heavy, lives that are full of weight, weight of knowledge of God, weight of glory of God. And our lives will not be gosong, but our lives will be full of goodness and of godliness. And teach us, Lord God, when we go out there to obey you, obey you first, obey you above all things. Give us opportunity to go, stand and tell, O oh Lord God. Open our eyes to opportunities open our eyes to people to their pain to their grief open our eyes to be attentive to be sensitive and to love one another not as not just as a as a salvation opportunity guys let's go beyond that let's love genuinely let's love sincerely I want to give you a moment to say your own prayer before the Lord Father we thank you Lord God that you will always be holy. Now may you bless our time gathering here. In Jesus' name, 